Welcome back. So in this video, I'm going to walk you through why the L1 norm is so useful for promoting sparse solutions to linear systems of equations. This is really kind of the geometric picture of why compressed sensing works uh, and why you can use the L1 norm for sparsity in general in uh, robust linear algebra. So this is kind of a cornerstone lecture for this chapter three uh, of data-driven science and engineering, where we're going to talk about all of these different sparse optimization procedures procedures uh, for robust statistics and robust solution of systems of equations and for compression and compressed sensing. Okay, so I'm really excited. This is uh, kind of a cool geometric uh, perspective on sparsity and the L1 norm. So I'm going to start with the L2 norm, which you are familiar with. So you know about the L2 norm. Uh, in, in this example here, I have kind of two coordinates. Um, I'm going to literally just call this um, Let's call this uh, S1, and we're going to call this S2. And the two norm is literally uh, the two norm of this vector of coefficients S, S1 and S2. The two norm is the sum of uh, S1 squared plus S2 squared square root. Okay, so this is the, the regular norm that you're used to for any kind of Euclidean vector space. This is just the regular norm uh, as far as we're concerned, okay? And I'm going to walk you through specifically how this is used to solve the compressed sensing problem. So I'm going to write down in math, uh, what we're trying to solve is y equals theta s. So we know y, we know theta, we're solving for s. And this is an undetermined system of equations, so there are infinitely many S's that satisfy this. Okay, so this is underdetermined, underdetermined, uh, and so that means there are infinitely many S's that satisfy that equation. Okay, and so what I'm going to do uh, in, in kind of picture here is I'm going to walk you through for the two norm how you can interpret this two-norm solution. And then we're going to look at why the one-norm is so good for promoting sparse solutions. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, and I'm going to draw this in kind of a big, uh, cartoonishly large version of this problem here. So again, we're going to have our two coordinates, S1 and S2. And the way you can think about this system of equations, y equals theta s, there's a whole family, there's infinitely many s's that will satisfy this equation. Let's say there are literally two unknowns, s1 and s2, and I only have one measurement, y1. Okay, Then this would define a line in s1, s2 space. Okay, And so I'm going to define this as a line uh, that literally satisfies, this is my line uh, of S that satisfies this equation, okay? And when I'm trying to find the minimum two-norm solution, so there are infinitely many S's that satisfy this equation, they live on this line here, and so what we're going to do is we're going to try to find uh, the specific S on this line that satisfies, that's the minimum of some norm. In this case, the minimum uh, two norm is this white dot here. Okay, so this has the minimum two norm on this family of solutions. And the way I like to think about this is I'm going to start with kind of little circles. These all, all of these points have equal two norm on this. Uh, they have equal radius. That's what the two norm is, is the radius. These all have equal two norm. And I'm going to grow this until I just intersect this line. And that means that this is the point on the line that has the minimum two norm. It, has the, it intersects the circle of minimum radius, of the smallest radius. Every other point intersects a larger radius and has a larger two norm, okay? So this is literally the uh, kind of L2 solution with the smallest uh, radius. And I'm going to put radius in quotes because we're going to kind of relax what we mean by radius in a minute. Okay, so that's literally what we mean. Out of all of these infinitely many possible solutions uh, of S that live on this line, we can find a specific one by finding the solution that minimizes the two norm. Okay, and that's what we did in the singular value decomposition is we found solutions that minimized the two norm, uh, which intersects this circle with that line. Good. 
Now, what we actually want to do in compressed sensing and in lots of other applications is we don't want the, the minimum two norm solution S. We want the S that is the sparsest possible S. It has as many zeros as possible and still satisfies this equation. Now, generally, that's achieved using uh, this zero norm uh, or the zero, the, the S that minimizes the zero norm, and that would intersect this uh, kind of pink plus sign with my blue uh, infinite set of solutions S. Okay, and you'll notice here that if you look kind of at this white dot where this, uh, where my, my solution space intersects the minimum size plus sign, it's only pointing in the S2 direction. So S1 is equal to zero. This is a sparse solution. Okay, it has one of its components equal to zero, and only one of those components is non-zero. So the L0 norm promotes sparsity. And this uh, L0 norm, it's not actually technically mathematically a norm. It doesn't satisfy all of the conditions that a norm needs to satisfy, but kind of morally we can use it to measure how far away we are uh, you know, from the origin in this, in this uh, L0 metric. So L0 is what we would actually want uh, to minimize because that gives you a truly sparse solution, but you can't find the minimum L0 norm solution using convex optimization. This is an NP hard problem to find this solution. So we can't do that. So instead, we use the L1 norm. This is why the L1 norm has gotten so much attention in the last few decades, is because the L1 norm, this you can solve for this minimum one norm solution in a convex way, uh, meaning it scales with Moore's law, it scales to bigger problems efficiently, and it tends to give you a sparse solution. So the, the minimum norm solution in the one norm of this blue line, if you kind of grow these diamonds, grow, 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 when it intersects this blue line first, it will typically be at a sparse solution. In this case where S2 is non-zero, but S1 is zero. And so this L1 norm, often if you solve for the minimum one norm, you happen to still get the sparsest solution that would have also satisfied the minimum zero norm. So this is what you want, but this is not computable. So instead we use the one norm, which is computable, and it tends to give you sparse solutions when you minimize that norm, okay? So again, just to recap, this uh, white dot here is the minimum one norm solution out of all of these infinitely many possible solutions. This white point has the minimum one norm. So I literally grow these one norm equal radius diamonds. I grow them and I grow them and I grow them until they intersect my, my solution family. And that point happens to be a sparse solution S. It is a solution because it's on this blue line and it's sparse because one of the components is equal to zero. And the cool thing is that this actually generalizes even better in higher dimensions. So the higher dimensions you go to, this uh, kind of analogy works even better. So these diamonds, uh, these diamond norms are really pointy, and they tend to intersect uh, underdetermined solution families at sparse solutions. So the one norm promotes sparse solutions to this underdetermined problem, and that's really, really useful. Uh, for robust solutions, for finding solutions that are not too complicated, that don't have too many free parameters. Lots and lots of uh, areas of machine learning and statistics and linear algebra where you want sparse solutions to these problems, okay? And the L1 norm is mathematically how we're going to get those sparse solutions. We're gonna find solutions S that minimize the one norm of S. Okay, that's what we're gonna do. Uh, and I'll just show these other ones because it's kind of fun. These are other norms. These are, I always joke with my students that this uh, is a circle in the one norm. This square is a circle in the infinity norm. This is a circle in the four norm and so on and so forth. So your idea of what it is to be a circle uh, is because you're measuring distance or radius in terms of this two norm, in terms of this distance here, this kind of uh, Pythagorean type distance, okay? Whereas if you measure distance uh, in the taxi cab norm, right, if I'm saying, well, it's just as easy for me to get here as it is for me to get here, 
then that norm has different circles, different equal distance points, okay? And so all of these norms have different circles or different, you know, level sets of equal distance. In the one norm, uh, I should write out what the one norm is for you. You probably want to know that. Uh, so the one norm of S is literally, uh, in this case, the absolute value of S1 plus the absolute value of S2. It's literally just how much of S1 and how much of S2, and that gives you these pointy kind of diamond shapes. In general, it would be the sum of the absolute value of all of the components of S if this is you know, uh, an n-dimensional vector, uh, and so on and so forth. You can define you know, all of these norms uh, in, in some, some way, and these pink curves are the level sets or the circles in those norms. Okay, great. So I hope I've convinced you that the L1 norm is an extremely useful norm for promoting sparse solutions of these underdetermined linear systems. And we'll use that a lot for robustifying our linear regressions, for robustifying the SVD uh, and principal components, and for solving the compressed sensing problem. All right, thank you.